Some water you turn into wine You open the eyes of the blind There's no one like you None like you And into the darkness you shine And out of the ashes we rise there's no one like you, not like you, Lord, no, sing our God is greater, our God is stronger, our God, you are higher than any other, our God is healer, God is greater and strong. Our God is stronger. God, you are. God, you are higher than any other. Our God is healer. Our God is healer. Our God. Our God. And if our God is for us, and if our God is for us, then who could ever stop us? And if our God is with us, then what can stand? You're the greatest one And we sing There's no God like Jehovah 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 When you gotta sing with us There's no God like There's no God like Jehovah there's no God like Jehovah. There's no God like Jehovah. No. There's no God like Jehovah. No one above him. There's no God like Jehovah. No There's no God like Jehovah. There's no one. There's no God like Jehovah. There's no God like Jehovah. There's no God like Jehovah. No God like Jehovah. There's 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 no God like Jehovah. No one. So we praise you, Lord. You're holy. You're mighty, Lord. You're great. God, you're stronger. We praise you, Lord. Good morning, church family. So good to be gathered with you to praise and worship Christ our King. Uh, good morning to all of you who are tuning in from various places in the country. Uh, we're so glad to have you uh, worshiping with us, and, and not just in the country, but actually abroad too. Uh, we're so glad to have you worshiping with us. Uh, we want to say a special welcome to you. If you're visiting with us, uh, let us know that you're worshiping with us this morning. If you're on YouTube, sort of pull up that chat function and just drop us a note to say hello. You'll find that we're a friendly bunch and, and we love to greet folks who are visiting with us. Um, church family, uh, good to be virtually gathered together in this way. 
Uh, we long and we are anticipating and looking forward to being able to gather in person. Uh, do pray for the team that Hannah Baker is leading in thinking about reopening in-person services in some fashion. Uh, we, we pray this spring, March or April, as we approach our sixth anniversary, uh, the first Sunday in April. Uh, do pray for that, and we'll be able to get back together and to see one another in a way that's safe um, and, and in a way that's life-giving rather than life-threatening. Um, so pray for that, church family. Well, there are a few announcements uh, about our life together as a church that I want to make you aware of. Uh, first off, let me tell you about some birthday celebrations. Um, so we have on February 1st, two new members uh, who are celebrating birthdays. They're birthday twins, uh, our brother Terrence Flowers and our brother Andrew Gore. And then the very next day, February 2nd, our sister Ashley Ayu has a birthday. And so do wish um, these brothers and sister uh, a happy birthday this week. Remember them in prayer. Hey, send them a gift card. You know, give them cash. They're too old for gifts. Give them cash. Let them know you love them, uh, at least with a word of encouragement. But beloved, those are our announcements for this morning. Let's quiet our hearts together uh, to continue in worship. Let's take a moment of silence together. Oh, to see the dawn of the darkest day, Christ on the road to Calvary. Tried by sinful men, torn and beaten then, nailed to a cross of wood. This the power of the cross, Christ became for us, took the blame, bore the wrath, we stand forgiven at the cross. Oh, to see the pain written on your face, bearing the awesome weight of sin, every bitter thought, every evil deed, crowning the blood-stained brow. This the power of the cross, Christ became sin for us, took the blame, bore the Sinful. 
for us, took the blame, bore the wrath we sin forgiven. Uh, my name is Isang Isang. Uh, I'm a relatively uh, new member. Um, I joined the church fairly recently. I'm part of the new batch uh, of members um, who got approved. Um, like to start the year off. Um, just wanted to you know share a bit of testimony uh, about myself. Um, last year, um, you know, I'm sure along with you know. A lot of us, uh, I was kind of just going through the motions and rolling with the punches and, uh, you know, not really taking the time to, you know, think about what was going on uh, in my life and, you know, how blessed I was. Uh, I was kind of just going through the motions with work and uh, we had our office closed. Um, we had an office in Arlington, Virginia um, that closed down. So we all we went to remote full time. Um, and so along with uh, juggling, um, going full-time remote um, and, you know, mixing virtual kindergarten uh, with my five-year-old, um, I wasn't really, you know, taking the time to kind of think about life and how things were going um, until uh, towards the end of the year last year, I got, I got injured and I had to have surgery. Um, so I couldn't, I couldn't work uh, you know, at all for about a month and a half. Um, and it wasn't until then that I had the opportunity to kind of sit back and, you know, realize how blessed I was uh, to just, you know, have gone through 2020 um, relatively unscathed uh, until that. But, you know, to think back that, you know, my company that I work for, you know, we had job cuts and, um, you know, people, you know, we're, we're kind of forced out or we're bought out to think that, um, you know, I made it through that and didn't uh, skip a beat to, you know, it's, it's just something that I didn't think about while it was happening um, until, you know, I was home in a cast and couldn't walk and, you know, wasn't working and couldn't do much of anything. But it wasn't until late last year that I thought about you know, just how blessed uh, my family uh, and I were for last year to have gone the way that um, it went. Because, you know, we all know someone or, you know, many people who, you know, last year was just, was awful for them. Um, so, you know, I'm, my testimony is just about just taking time to thank God and, you know, not, not over playing. I think I got caught up last year. <laughs> with all of uh, the things that were going on, you know, and kind of reworking my 2020 plans um, and kind of scaling them back or pushing them back into plans for this year, not realizing that, you know, shouldn't be planning any, you know, too much of anything really, because um, we just don't know what's what's going to happen. And, you know, it's out of our, it's out of our hands, it's out of our control. Um, so, you know, this year I'm really working on, um, slowing down and allowing, um, you know, God to take control of my life and just, you know, show me the way, um, the verse I'm really going to try and stick to and obey this year is, uh, Philippians 4, 6. It's, uh, do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation by prayer and petition with Thanksgiving, uh, present your request to God. Um, so I'm going to try and live by that this year, um, more often than just, you know, remember 
the important things. Remember that everything's in God's hands. And, you know, if you ever find yourself uh, this year struggling with overthinking or um, planning, um, just know I'm, I'm right there with you and I'm, I'm doing my best to, to also, uh, you know, remember to leave everything, um, you know, in the Lord's hands. Uh, so I'm um, happy to be a part of the uh, ARC family. Um, it, it's been a, a few years since I, I joined the church. Um, so I'm very excited um, to learn about the new members and uh, to go through my new member class um, and, you know, see how I can, I can serve, not how I can uh, contribute. So um, thank you. And I hope everyone has, you know, a beautiful, beautiful day and, um, you know, a beautiful year as we all work together um, and try and uh, get things done uh, uh, in the name of the Lord and, and you know, just, you know, kind of keep on keeping on. So thank you. Come behold the wondrous mystery in the dawning of the King. He the theme of heaven's praises, robed in frail humanity. In our longing, in our darkness, now the light of life has come. Look to Christ who condescended, took on flesh to ransom us. Come behold the wondrous mystery in the perfect Son of Man. In His living, in His suffering, never trace nor strain of sin. See the true and better Adam come to save the help of man, Christ the great of the law in him we stand come behold the wondrous mystery christ the lord upon the tree in the stead of ruined sinners is the land the price of our redemption see the father's plan unfold bringing many sons to glory grace unmeasured love untold come behold the time to hear from God, from his word. If you have your Bibles, turn with me to Psalm 12, the 12th Psalm. I'm going to read that for us this morning, and I'm going to offer a word of prayer. But so that we might understand it well as we read it, let me say just a couple of lines about this psalm. 
It is a, a prayer, and it's a prayer of David. And David is looking around the country, and he's like, the righteous have vanished. The, the righteous are gone. Uh, and he has this sense that what's left in the country are people who are not righteous, people who utter lies, people with deceitful lips. You notice the reference to lips several times here. And David actually prays that God would, God would judge these folks. Then in verse 5, God actually speaks. He speaks about what he will do to both judge and to save. And then David ends the psalm in praise. And that, let, that, let that be our pattern for prayer this morning as, we, as well as we read this psalm. So look with me, Psalm 12, beginning in verse 1. To the choir master, according to the Sheminith, a psalm of David. Save, O Lord, for the godly one is gone. For the faithful have vanished from among the children of man. Everyone utters lies to his neighbor. With flattering lips and a double heart they speak. May the Lord cut off all flattering lips, the tongue that makes great boasts. Those who say, with our tongue we will prevail, our lips are with us, who is master over us? Because the poor are plundered, because the needy groan, I will now arise, says the Lord. I will place him in the safety for which he longs. The words of the Lord are pure words like silver refined in a furnace on the ground, purified seven times. You, O Lord, will keep them. You will guard us from this generation forever. On every side, the wicked prowl as vileness is exalted among the children of man. Let's pray together. Father, we cry out with your servant David. Where have the godly gone? The faithful seem to have vanished from among us. We do live in a world where unrighteousness seems to be foisted upon the public by those who use their lips to deceive. There are people who call babies in the womb a choice rather than a life. There are politicians who make promises on one side of their mouth and deny them with the other side of their mouth. There are those who are even our friends whose hearts are deceitful, who speak to us out of those hearts and, and Lord, speak to manipulate and speak to um, swindle. Lord, we live in a world full of deceitful hearts and double speak, of flatterers and boasters, those who think that they will prevail by their much talking, by the eloquence of their mouths, who think that there's no one who can stop them. They plunder the poor, the needy groan, the marginalized are pushed further to the margins. Save, O oh Lord. Come quickly in your righteousness and your justice. We hear you say to David, and we take these to be words for us, that you will now arise, O Lord, that you will place the needy and the poor, the plundered, in the safety for which they long. Rise up, O Lord, rise up and, and make your righteousness to prevail. Make your justice to stand. Rise up and show the power of your right hand. Rise up and save, not just from the, the whispers and the lies of unrighteous lips. Rise up and save from the licking flames of hell. Rise up and save, O oh Lord, from eternal torment. Rescue those, Lord, who are in danger of perishing because of their sin. You have promised in your word that all who believe in you would indeed have their record cleansed, would indeed be forgiven all of their sins, would have their sins removed from them as far as the east is from the west. And we declare with David that your words are pure words. They're like silver refined in a furnace on the ground. Your words are, are like 
purify silver seven times. And so we believe your promise that all who turn from sin and put their faith in you shall be saved shall have eternal life, shall be righteous with you, shall be reconciled to you, and shall inherit your eternal kingdom. We believe this because your word is true and you have spoken it. So there is salvation, even in a nation where the righteous seems to have vanished. There is salvation with you. And Lord, we praise you for how you protect your church how you guard us and guide us. We saw a, a powerful and a, frankly, a disturbing example of it this past Monday. When a man drunk and overcome with sin, drunk and overcome with the, the enemy's thoughts, opened fire just across the street from our coffee and convo team. Lord, how you spared the lives of all of our brothers and sisters. How you were gracious to many others also on that block. We mourn, oh Lord, with Christine, the loss of her son, Ed, Lord Edward. We pray that you would comfort her. Only you can fill the hole in her heart right now. Only you can give her strength right now. Such an unnatural way for a mother's relationship to end with a son. Such a tragic thing, Lord. But your spirit is the comforter. And so we pray, send forth your spirit to comfort her. Hold her up even by our prayers right now. And we thank you that Miss Carol could be there to hold her as she wept and to pray for her. Um, Lord, we, we thank you that not only did you spare the saints that day, but, but you used the saints. And we pray, continue to use us, we ask. We pray for those who were wounded. We ask for their full and complete recovery. We thank you for the police department that was able to make one arrest. We pray, oh Lord, that others involved would be arrested too. And, and more than that, they would be arrested by you, that you would stop their hearts, oh Lord, in the tracks of evil and turn them to righteousness. Turn them to faith in Christ. Make your justice to be done, O oh Lord. Father, we live in a world where on every side the wicked prowl, vileness is exalted among the children of men in this generation. But we know that you are going to make your righteousness shine like the noonday sun. We know for forever, O oh Lord, is your throne established in heaven. We know that you rule and you will rule and that your will will be done. We know that you will care for your people and bring us safely home. We know that you will use us, O oh Lord, as light in a dark world. We know, O oh Lord, the goodness of the Lord. We have tasted it and seen it. Give us another taste. Give us another glimpse. Do this, O oh Lord, we pray, for your glory and the blessing of your people. In Jesus' name. Beloved, it is time to dig together into God's word, to hear him speak to us, uh, and to draw yet more faith and instruction from his perfect word. Let's pray together. Father, we ask now that you would speak to us by your word. Just as we were praying a moment ago, we confess that your word is pure. Every, every part of it is pure. It's like silver refined in a furnace seven times. Make it pure silver, make it pure gold, refined in our hearts, O oh Lord. Uh, cause it to be to us of great value, of great worth, just as it were gold, just as it were silver, even more precious than rubies. So Lord, bless us as we come to your word, give us understanding, and help us in our faith, we pray, in Jesus' name. Well, beloved, we continue this morning in our study, our series, which we've called Strange Times, Same Mission. Uh, we are sort of sampling from sections in the book of Acts in this opening series of 2021 uh, to do as we customarily do in the new year, to sort of reset ourselves on our own basic mission, 
and how we pursue that mission, our own basic objectives, which we call the five M's. If you're new to the church this morning, our mission uh, is to glorify God by making disciples of the Lord Jesus Christ from the four corners of the block to the four corners of the globe. So we want to be about what Jesus calls us to be about in Matthew 28, 19, and 20, when he says, all authority in heaven and earth has been given to him. Therefore, now go and make disciples, um, baptizing them in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to observe everything that he has commanded. And he's promised that he would be with his church as we did that. And so the times that we live in are strange. Again, we are seeing... Um, unnatural things, wicked things, like the, the shooting this past Monday on the block and taking the life of, of a young man just 21 years old, uh, wounding for others. That's not natural. I know it's common in our neighborhood and uh, southeast, east of the river is common in other parts of the city, it's common in other neighborhoods and other cities. But beloved, let us never confuse common with natural. It's strange to wake up and decide to take a life. It's not from God. It's not from God. And that's what makes it so strange, so wicked, so evil. And not just that, but we, we see wickedness and evil in other places. Just in this year, again, we could go back to the riots at the Capitol. That's unusual. That's strange. That's wrong. And we can come on down to all kinds of things that are happening in our country. Think, for example, about the, the right of executive orders and the, the overturning of restrictions on abortion so that children might be killed in the womb. That's strange, beloved. That's strange. It's unnatural. Never in the history of the world have so many countries made it, quote, legal, which is to say it is good take the life of unborn children. And so now Poland stands out as unusual, as a country restricting, restricting abortion rights. And people are taken to the streets in Poland protesting against their government. These are strange times on our block. And these are strange times in the nations. But our mission is the same. Our mission is the same, is to go into the world, to make disciples, to baptize them, and to teach them to observe all that Jesus has commanded. That is the most fundamental way that we oppose the strangeness of the world, the fallenness, the brokenness, the evil of the world, is by making disciples of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, we put that mission into five objectives. We call them our five ends. We want to emphasize the message of the gospel. We want to emphasize mercy, showing mercy to our neighbors. And as we talked last week, we want to emphasize maturity in Christ, shepherding each other to maturity. And this week, we want to come to our fourth M, which is multiplication. We want to emphasize the, the seeking of multiplication, particularly with regard to leaders and church plants. We want to see the gospel grow through planting more churches and we want to see those churches and our church be led by qualified, gifted, spiritual leaders as the Lord directs in his word. Now, think about this more. I want us to think about two passages from Acts. Acts chapter 1, uh, around verse 12 to the end of the chapter, and Acts chapter 6, verses 1 to 7. Now, if you want to hear a longer treatment of the sort of development of leadership uh, in the book of Acts and in the Bible, um, go back to our series called Being the Church. Uh, there's a sermon in there on this very topic uh, of leadership. Check out that series and you'll get sort of a fuller view. Now, what I want to do this morning is to sort of zero in on a few passages, a few key um, verses in these passages that help us to think about some aspects of leadership. Um, and they all come in twos, the sort of points I want to make come in twos. So look with me, first of all, in Acts chapter 1. And we want to consider, uh, for context, verses 12 to the end of the chapter. This is what God's Word says. Then they returned to Jerusalem from the mount called Olivet, which is near Jerusalem, a Sabbath day's journey away. And when they had entered, they went up to the upper room where they were staying, Peter and John and James and Andrew, 
Philip and Thomas, Bartholomew and Matthew, James the son of Alphaeus, and Simon the Zealot, and Judas the son of James. All these with one accord were devoting themselves to prayer, together with the women and Mary the mother of Jesus and his brothers. In those days Peter stood up among the brothers, the company of persons was in all about a hundred and twenty, and said, Brothers, the scripture had to be fulfilled, which the Holy Spirit spoke beforehand by the mouth of David concerning Judas, who became a guide to those who arrested Jesus, for he was numbered among us and was allotted his share in this ministry. Now this man bought a field with the reward of his wickedness, and falling headlong, he burst open in the middle, and all his bowels gushed out. And it became known to all the inhabitants of Jerusalem, so that the field was called in their own language a keldama, that is, field of blood. For it is written in the book of Psalms, May his camp become desolate, and let there be no one to dwell in it, and let another take his office. So one of the men who have accompanied us during all, t all the time that the Lord Jesus went in and out among us, beginning from the baptism of John until the day when he was taken up from us, one of these men must become with us a witness to his resurrection. And they put forward two, Joseph called Barsabbas, who was also called Justice, and Matthias. And they prayed and said, You, Lord, who know the hearts of all, who show which one of these two you have chosen to take the place in this ministry and apostleship from which Judas turned aside to go to his own place. And they cast lots for them, and the lot fell on Matthias, and he was numbered with the eleven apostles. So just for a little word of context here, this is after the resurrection and the ascension of the Lord Jesus Christ. In the early verses of Acts, we see the apostles gathered around Jesus as he ascends up into heaven. And the angel says to them, why do you stand here looking up into heaven where he's gone? You know, he's going to come back from that place in glory. And the implication is you guys need to get on with the mission. And so in verses 12 to 15, they're just outside of Jerusalem in the Mount of Olives, or the Mount, of, Mount Olivet, and they're praying, they're having a prayer meeting. And in verse 15 is when Peter stands up and addresses the 120 disciples that are there, and he addresses them basically about two necessities. Two necessities, this is the first point. There are two necessities to gospel ministry. Number one, the necessity of the scripture and the Gospels, the necessity of the Scripture and the Gospels. That's what we see in verses 16 and 17. Peter says, brothers, the Scripture had to be fulfilled. There is not one jot or tittle, Jesus says in Matthew 5, 17, that will pass away of the Scripture until it's all fulfilled. So what Peter is saying here is really a, a summary of, uh, a repeating of what Jesus has taught them during his earthly ministry, that the word of God will stand until it's all fulfilled, until it's all complete. And what we have here as we've been praying today is, is gold purified seven times. What we have here is the very word of God in the Bible. And so anybody who's going to lead in God's church must lead by God's word. Not by man's word, not by man's ideas, but what's necessary is the scripture. Now notice now, not just the scripture, but notice also the, the fulfillment of the gospel. Peter goes on to say here, Brothers, the scripture had to be fulfilled, which the Holy Spirit spoke beforehand by the mouth of David concerning Judas. Now you see what he's saying there? That God the Holy Spirit was speaking through a man, speaking through King David. This is what we call the doctrine of inspiration. We believe that the word of God is breathed out by God through men whom he uses to write down his word. That's basically what Peter is saying there. This is why the Bible is necessary. It is God's word. So he says, uh, spoke through uh, David concerning Judas, who became a guide to those who arrested Jesus. Now what is Peter talking about there. Well, those events in Peter's day when he said this was about two months ago or so. It wasn't long at all. He is interpreting what has happened to Jesus according to the scripture. It's saying that the Bible in the Psalms, in the writings of David, had foretold the, the betrayal of Jesus by Judas. 
And that what has happened here in Jesus' betrayal and his death, his burial and his resurrection is all fulfilling the central message of the Bible. That that's what God promised centuries before. That's what he has accomplished in the life of his son. That's what we preach today. This is the main message of Christianity. This is what we call the gospel, the good news. So anybody who is going to be in Christian ministry must understand the necessity of the Bible and the Bible's teaching about the gospel. Now, it may be that you're listening this morning and that word gospel, you hear it all the time. You associate it with music, perhaps, or uh, maybe you associate it broadly with truth. We have a little cliche, something is the, quote, gospel truth. But that word has specific content from a biblical perspective. That word has specific meaning. When we Christians who understand the Bible talk about the gospel, we're not talking about the first four books of the New Testament, which are also called gospels. They record the life of Jesus. We're not talking about gospel music. We're not even using a cliche like the gospel truth. When we talk about the gospel, we mean specifically what the Bible says happened to Jesus for our salvation. The Son of God came into the world and took upon himself human flesh. He came in our likeness. And he did that for two reasons. He did that, number one, in order to obey God in our place. So he lives for 33 years in earthly life, all 33 years, every second of it, without sin, in complete obedience to God the Father. Why was that important? Well, because all of humanity owes obedience to God. But all of humanity has already sinned against God. From our very first parent, Adam and Eve, all the way down to you and me, we have all sinned against God. And we deserve judgment from God because our sin is against him. And God promises that he will judge sin. That's why there's death. That's why there's disease. And that's why there's a final judgment called hell. God will set things to right. And that includes judging every individual. So the first reason Jesus comes is to give that righteousness to God in our place because we could never be righteous and obey God perfectly. The second reason he comes in the gospel is to die for us then. So after living a perfectly righteous life, the Son of God then dies for us on the cross, giving himself as a sacrifice for God to punish in our place. So on the cross, he is taking all the righteous anger of God against sin upon himself. He's taking all of our sin upon himself, all the sin of all the world from Adam all the way down to the end. He is being punished for it on the cross as our substitute to turn away God's wrath. He dies. He's buried. He remains buried for three days. And on the third day, he rises from the grave in resurrection power. And what the gospel tells us is the resurrection is the proof that God accepted his sacrifice. And the resurrection is the evidence that Jesus really is the Son of God. And the resurrection is the evidence, it's the testimony that we are now right with God, we are at peace with God, forgiven by God, and have eternal life through faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. And that's the gospel, that everyone who puts their faith in Jesus has this new life with God, has entered into a, a new creation, really. And ultimately, the whole creation will be made new so that there'll be no more death, there'll be no more dying, there'll be no more weeping, there'll be no more drive-bys, there'll be no more abortions, there'll be no more lying and stealing, none of that. We will live with God as we were originally meant to be. That's the good news, beloved. This world is not the end. This world is just the, the middle passage. The end is all glory, all love, all joy, all satisfaction with God through faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. And so if you're listening this morning, that's what we want you to believe. Put your faith in Jesus. Confess your personal sins to God. Ask for his forgiveness and put your faith in the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be made new, and you will be brought to God no longer as someone, uh, a criminal, indicted to judgment. You will be brought to God as his own dear son or daughter through faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. 
forever to live with him in the kingdom that's to come. Put your faith in Christ this morning. And if you do, let us know. We'd like to pray for you and encourage you. But beloved, the first thing we see here in verses 16 and 17 is the necessity of the scripture and the gospel. Christian leadership must be committed to the Bible and committed to the gospel or it ceases to be Christian in any meaningful sense. Now, the second thing, the second necessity we see here is the necessity of enough leadership. The necessity of enough leadership. We see that in verses 21 and 22. Here's the conclusion of Peter's talk. So one of the men who have accompanied us during all the time that the Lord Jesus went in and out among us, beginning from the baptism of John until the day when he was taken up from us, one of these men, notice, must become with us a witness to his resurrection. Again, Peter here is thinking about the Lord Jesus' teaching. He's thinking about the fact that there was originally 12 apostles, but Judas has betrayed Jesus and taken his own life. So there's a vacancy in the apostleship. And, and, and Peter sees in the writings of David from the Psalms in verse 20 that there is, um, there is warrant there to replace him and to have a, a 12th apostle. I, I put this in terms of having enough leadership because I don't think that what Peter is thinking is we need another apostle for these 120 disciples. You remember back in verse 15, it says there were 120 of them gathered together. That's the whole church. That's all the church there was in the whole world at that point. Those 120 people who believed in the Lord Jesus. So 12 apostles, that would have been a ratio of 10 saints to one leader. <laughs> I take that any day. That's a great ratio. But I don't think that's primarily what's in view. I think the point it's not that they were trying to staff the apostleship for the current number of disciples. Listen, they were trying to staff the apostleship for the growth that would come later. Jesus promised to build an entire kingdom made up of people from every nation. They didn't need more leaders for the 120. They needed more leaders, enough leaders for the growth of the kingdom. I want to put this in terms of a, a couple of little leadership principles here. Number one, notice that leadership is necessary. It's necessary. And, and notice number two, that where possible, we want to have enough leaders to handle future growth, should the Lord give it. And this, beloved, I think is the biggest challenge to the growth of most churches in the West. We simply don't have enough leaders to stay ahead of and to prepare for the growth that is to come. This, I think, is the biggest challenge to the growth of most churches. And I mean all sorts of churches, from mega churches to small country churches. Uh, most local congregations, it seems to me, need more leaders than they actually have if, if they're anticipating and wanting to see addition to the church uh, by God's grace. This is what makes training leaders so important. I mean, in, in Christian ministry, leaders are not born. They don't just drop down out of the sky and, and sort of come prepackaged, ready to jump in and do the work. It is true, Ephesians chapter 4, verses 11 to 17, that God gives gifted people as, as gifts to the church to serve as leaders. Some apostles, some prophets, some prophets and teachers and evangelists and so on. But it is also true, 2 Timothy 2, 2, where Paul says, find faithful men and basically train them uh, so that they might be able to teach and to train others. It is also true that leadership is a relay race. We have to invest in people. Now, I think this requires two mind shifts for churches, and maybe two mind shifts for us this morning. Number one, we have to stop thinking of Christian leadership as optional. We can't think of it as something that either we could take or leave. We can't think of Christian leadership as something that... Um, you know, as, a, as an individual Christian, I can either sort of receive it or not receive it. Nor can we think of entering Christian leadership, becoming a leader, as something that we take or leave, as something that we treat entirely as 
and optional, not necessary to the church. So that's the way we've been thinking. We've actually got to come to see what we see here in the very first church and the first leaders that, that filling the offices of the church, filling the leadership vacancies of the church is necessary. Here's the second mind shift. And I've already alluded to it. We have to start prayerfully considering the possibility of, of your or your spouses becoming a leader. If, if we are going to multiply leaders and churches, then we need actually Christians to do that with. We, we need Christians to actively consider the possibility. I mean, try this. You think to yourself, you ask the question, what does it look like to consider the possibility? Try, try this. Try putting yourself in the shoes of the prophet Isaiah when he was called. You remember that famous passage? Isaiah chapter 6, verse 8. Isaiah has seen this vision of God you know, high and lifted up, his train is filling the heavens, and, and the, the angels are crying out, holy, 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 and Isaiah is undone by what he sees, and then there's this, this brief conversation that happens between God and Isaiah. Isaiah chapter 6, verse 8, and I heard the voice of the Lord saying, whom shall I send, and who will go for us? Then I said, Isaiah, here I am, send me. That's what it looks like to consider leadership. Put yourself in Isaiah's shoes and ask yourself, will you answer the Lord the same way Isaiah did by saying, here I am, send me. Send me into leadership. Send me into pastoral ministry. Send me into diaconal ministry. Send me into some volunteer role. Send me into leadership out in the nonprofit world or the business world or the government world. Will you answer that way? And if not, why not? Why not? What reason do you have as a creature for turning to your God, your creator, and saying, no, I won't go? No, Lord, no. What reason can you offer that's a compelling reason for saying no to the God who made you and saved you. Now, we will also need some spouses to say, here's my husband, <laughs> here's my wife, send him. We'll need some spouses to come alongside uh, their, their partners and to be supportive. Many spouses say, you know, the husband or the wife is like, you know, here I am, send me. And the spouse is like, no, stay right there, you ain't going nowhere. I'm reminded of a, a dear woman, faithful, faithful woman, loves the Lord, praises the Lord, committed to the church, had the privilege of, of pastoring her many years ago. And her husband, also a faithful man, delightful brother, joyful in the Lord, zealous for the things of God, obviously discipling and caring for lots of people in the church. And we began to talk to him as, as, as a possibility of becoming an elder in the church, and, and he was humbled by it. He didn't, he didn't see himself necessarily as um, a leader in that way. He was, he was made aware of um, some of his own struggles. Which is, which is part of the process and the call, but nevertheless, he was leaning into it, and, and I thought he would have been a fantastic elder. But his wife had um, seen that church go through a split and some other things, and she remembered how embattled the elders were some years prior, and the wife's perspective was, you know, the moment you become a leader, spiritual warfare gets dialed up. And she wasn't wrong. She wasn't wrong. But she looked at that, and instead of saying, here I am, send me, or here he is, send my husband, I got his back, we will war together on our knees, she looked at that and said, no, 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 we don't need all that smoke. You know, we're just going to keep our life the way it is. We'll let somebody else leave the church. That, I want to suggest to you, coming from an otherwise very godly and wonderful woman, was not the right answer to your Savior and your Creator. When he calls us to go. 
And it may be that there are some listening to this now who is either themselves or looking at a spouse and they're thinking to themselves, no, let somebody else go. I want to challenge you this morning. I think you may need a mind shift. I think you may need a different perspective in order that you actually might flourish in the midst of the, the graces that come with leadership and in order that the church might flourish and multiply the way God intends us to according to his word. Now I want to see us, uh, I want us to see a third pairing, uh, but to do that we need to turn to Acts chapter 6. So turn with me to Acts chapter 6. Look with me at verses 1 to 7. Now in these days, when the disciples were increasing in number, a complaint by the Hellenists arose against the Hebrews because their widows were being neglected in the daily distribution. And the twelve summoned the full number of the disciples and said, It is not right that we should give up preaching the word of God to serve tables. Therefore, brothers, pick out from among you seven men of good repute, full of the Holy Spirit and of wisdom, whom we will appoint to this duty. But we will devote ourselves to prayer and to the ministry of the word. And what they said pleased the whole gathering, and they chose Stephen, a man full of faith and of the Holy Spirit, and Philip, and Prochorus, and Nicanor, and Timon, and Parmenas, and Nicolaus, a proselyte of Antioch. These they set before the apostles, and they prayed and laid their hands on them. And the word of God continued to increase, and the number of disciples multiplied greatly in Jerusalem, and a great many of the priests became obedient to the faith. Now, Leadership issues occur in the church. They keep coming up in the church. So right from chapter 1, we saw that the issue of, of replacing the apostle was there in the church. Now, just because you saw one issue doesn't mean all the issues are going to be solved, right? There are going to be other challenges. In some sense, leadership is an exercise in constant problem solving. And that's what we see here in chapter 6 of Acts 6. Two problems. Two problems. They're, all, they're both stated there in verse 1. Now in these days, when the disciples were increasing in number, a complaint by the Hellenists arose against the Hebrews because their widows were being neglected in the daily distribution. Notice the first problem. They've got a growth problem. They've got a growth problem. It's a good problem to have, but it is still a problem. The, the gospel is growing. Conversions are happening. People are being added to the church. So in that sense, what Jesus promised in Matthew 28 and in Acts chapter 1, verse 8, it's being fulfilled right here. People are coming to the Lord by the thousands. It's a strange time because there's this supernatural revival happening. But growth isn't always success, particularly if you're not prepared for it. We can crash on the rocks of growth and sink because we were growing too fast. Growth is a problem if you can't handle it. And, and, and again, there's such a thing as growing too fast. That's the first problem we see in the first part of verse 1. Here's the second problem in the second part of verse 1. Notice there, a complaint by the Hellenists, those are Greek-speaking Jewish people, arose against the Hebrews, those are Jewish-speaking Jewish people, because their widows were being neglected in the daily distribution. So the second problem is a problem of injustice or inequity and cultural conflict. This is the kind of problem that happens, actually, when things are going well, when, when, when things are growing too fast and you don't have enough leaders. People get left out and overlooked. There are some widows who are being missed in the daily distribution. And sometimes those kinds of problems occur along ethnic, cultural, here, language lines. Why is that? Well, remember from last week, we said that when we mature, we want to become cross-cultural Christians. Well, here you see another, another example of why that's, that's so necessary. We see an example here in the early church showing that the failure to be sort of adept at cross-cultural relationships and including people from different backgrounds and, and being aware of them will show up in conflicts like this around injustice and inequity. 
And we know how it happens. It, it easily happens. Not necessarily because somebody's being wicked and prejudiced, necessarily. But it can easily happen simply because the, the dominant group in the church will naturally consider its own needs. And because it's the larger group, will often see those needs more readily than they will the other group, the minority group. They will often overlook people and other people simply by leaning into the privilege of being dominant. I think that's what's happening here in Acts 6. And I think it's important for us to recognize that just being in the same church doesn't mean we're unified and we're showing equal concern for each other. And that's part of our goal. In 1 Corinthians 12, 26 and 27, Paul uses that body analogy where he talks about we're all parts of the body. I'm an eye, you're a foot, so on and so forth. And he says there that God has arranged each part in the body so that we might have equal concern for one another. So you're given the gift that you're given and you're placed in the body where you're placed. God has done that sovereignly and intentionally so that what will result is the whole body will have equal concern for every part of the body. Well, that wasn't happening here in Acts 6. And that's why we need to be cross-cultural Christians. And that's why we need to be conversant and comfortable with conversations around equity and justice and fairness and distribution. Because the widows were being left out here. You know, achieving equal concern, every part for the other, requires leadership and it requires intentionality in addressing injustices and misunderstandings and prejudices and the likes. So those are the two problems that we see there uh, in Acts chapter 6. They, it threatens to break apart the church right here in the church's infancy. And it involves cultural and language and uh, class kinds of issues because the widows would have been poor. They would not have had any other family. So they were entirely dependent on the church for their meals and their livelihood. So you've got culture, language, class, all of that clashing in this little cross-cultural laboratory called the church. Now notice the two solutions. So we're just looking at the two problems, growth and these sort of injustices along cultural lines. Notice the two solutions that result. See it there beginning in verse 3 or verse 2. And the twelve summoned the full number of the disciples and said, It is not right that we should give up preaching the word of God to serve tables. Therefore, brothers, pick out from among you seven men of good repute, full of the spirit and of wisdom, whom we will appoint to this duty. But we will devote ourselves to prayer and to the ministry of the word. Now, I think, oh, I know, because it's in the Bible, that's a spirit-inspired response to the problem. Because think about it, if, if you're a leader in an organization and people come to you complaining about something that seems to be sort of cultural prejudice and some really poor people in need not getting their needs met, if you're a leader in that organization and you're a person of any, compa any compassion, the thing you're most going to want to do is to see to it that that gets fixed yourself. I mean, the, the thought that's going to kick in is the buck stops with me, and that's got to be fixed, right? But that's not what Peter does here. And I think he's being led by the, the Holy Spirit here. First of all, notice what he does. This is the first solution he delegates. He delegates. So he says in verse 2, it's not right that we should give up preaching the word of God to serve tables. Now, he's not downplaying serving tables. He is actually recognizing the priority of the ministry of the word. And, and, and what he's doing here is he's avoiding creating a second problem in order to fix a first problem. So, so he could leave the word and serve tables, but then who's going to preach the word? Now, it's the word that gives life. It's the word that must be taught. It's the word that's at the heart of the mission of the church. And without the word, the church stop, stops being the church. So he doesn't want to create a second bigger problem to go focus on this other big problem. 
And so in, in his wisdom, he's delegating now. So he says to the congregation, you know what? You're going to have to choose seven people from among yourselves to serve this need. Now, I, I, I take from this two things. Number one, this is likely, possibly, the creation of the role of deacons. So he's creating a whole other leadership office alongside the elders to take care of the practical needs of the church, what he calls serve tables. Secondly, I think what we see here is Peter recognizing that the congregation on some level has to solve its own problems. Let me say that again. The congregation on some level has to be mature enough and committed enough and together enough to solve some of its own problems. So let me give you an illustration. So it's really tempting to bring every interpersonal conflict in a church to the pastors for mediation or resolution. But that's not actually what the Bible teaches. In places like Matthew 5, Matthew 18, the Bible says in Matthew 5, if you're at the altar giving your, your, your gift in worship to God and there you remember that your brother has something against you, leave your gift at the altar, go and, and show your brother's fault, uh, and be reconciled with your brother, then come worship. It doesn't say go tell the pastor and then have the pastor go and sit between the two of you, but you go go win your brother. Matthew chapter 18 starts the same way. Um, if your brother sins against you, go to your brother, just the two of you, and show him his fault and be reconciled. Now, the next step in Matthew chapter 18 still doesn't involve the pastors. It says, listen, um, you go to your brother, if that doesn't work, he doesn't hear you, go back with two or three witnesses and try to win your brother, right? There are things that arise in the life of a congregation that really do need to be addressed, but don't need to be addressed by the pastors, that the congregation needs to address on some level. And sometimes praying for and looking for leaders is one of those things, just as Peter does here in Acts chapter 6. Now, there's another thing I want to say about this delegation. I think Peter is demonstrating for us that the congregation has the gifted persons it needs for the work of the ministry and for addressing its problems. That God has put in the body the gifts, the gifted persons that are needed for the edification of the body. Beloved, we've got to believe this. We have got to believe this. We have got to have a charismatic understanding of the church. When I say charismatic, I don't mean speaking in tongues and healings and all kinds of things that make some Christians nervous and other people excited. I simply mean the charisma, the gifts are given to the body. And that we need to look at the church as a gifted body of people whom God has sovereignly equipped for the work of the ministry. Because here's what happens if we don't believe that. We then sort of turn the ministry of the church into a professional ministry. We begin to see ourselves as members as not having much to contribute, and we begin to sort of assign all the problems, all the opportunities, all the ideas, everything, basically to those we pay to do the work of the ministry. You want to weaken a church? You want to cause a church to shrivel on the vine? Then start acting as if the only people who can do anything are the leaders of the church. Peter doesn't take that attitude here. He, he understands that there are gifted people in the body who are capable of doing the work of the ministry. And indeed, they find seven people full of the Holy Spirit and full of the qualities that Peter outlines for them in this text. This means, beloved, that we need to actually be the kind of congregation that, that invests in and gives opportunity to and, and even takes risks, wise, appropriate risks, with letting people do the work of the ministry. This is why with our PSA teams, we, we haven't divided you up into teams and then from on high, as pastor says, here are the two or three things we need each team to do as if we have all the solutions and all the gifts and all the ideas. We don't. But we believe the body does. Because we believe God has designed the body that way. 
And we believe that what comes out of the body, comes out of the PSA, team, PSA teams, for example, that's going to be richer and more effective um, and, and, and more dynamic than if we just sort of said, we're the leaders, we got all the answers. We don't. And so in, in delegating, Peter is showing his belief that the congregation has been given by God, gifted people for the work of the ministry. Here's the other thing he, he demonstrates in this delegation, that the leaders must be humble enough to trust the body with the ministry. Peter doesn't panic and say, okay, guys, okay, the 12 of us now, you know, those who are going to know what they're doing, we got to do it. That would be pride. That would be arrogant. But in humility, he lets other people take the reins. He takes this important problem, get this now, a problem so important it's threatening the unity of the church and threatening to halt the growth of the church. He takes this important problem and says, you guys find seven folks who can take care of this work. That's humble leadership. That's leadership that trusts God. That's leadership that trusts the people of God. And that's the kind of leaders we want to be and the kind of leaders we want to have. So in addressing, addressing these two problems, there were two solutions. The first is delegation. The second is specialization. Specialization. Notice what he says in verse 4. We will give attention to the word of God and prayer. Like I said, he didn't want to take one problem and allow that to drive him into an even bigger problem of neglecting the ministry of the word, neglecting the ministry of prayer. No, nope. he said, actually, we need to sort of now specialize so that all the things that need to get done in the life of the church, from providing to the widows to ministering the word, uh, from making sure that those who have no family have their provision, to making sure that as leaders in the family of God, we are praying to our Father. So that required some specialization. And, and from that, we, we got to learn, we, we must learn, we must understand uh, as a Christian church that the ministry of the word is of highest importance. There are lots of other things that a church has to do. There are lots of other things that a pastor has to do. But none of them compare to the sustained, regular, prayerful, dedicated ministry of teaching the Word of God. And what we need in any congregation is for all the members to understand that, right? For all the members to understand that it is the ministry of the Word that gives God's people life, and it's the ministry of prayer that, that calls upon God's power, and of all the things we may need in the world, some of them very important, this, this is the most important, and therefore this is the one thing we do not want our pastoral leadership to abandon. I love the time where I've, again, in previous church years ago, had an older saint in the hospital and needing a visit. And I sort of called to, to sort of come over and want to see him at the hospital, do a visit. And she, a very godly older saint, said, no, I, today's your sermon prep day. You, you need to stay and, and work on your sermon to, to feed God's people on Sunday. I'll be all right. There are doctors here. There are members of the church coming over, caring for me. Uh, it's enough that you call. Okay, that's the, that's the godly, seasoned, wise attitude uh, of an older saint that all of us want to learn from and gather from. Uh, and staying in the book, staying in the word, as Peter and apostles do, that's what we want to sort of emulate as leaders, as we specialize in God's word. Let me say another thing about the specialization that, again, there's so many things for leaders to learn and to be involved in. But in the Christian church, there's only one thing we need to be expert in. That's the knowledge of the Bible, right? So when it comes to other areas of ministry, for example, um, we, we, we may be competent to counsel, borrow the title of Jay Adams' book from years ago, we may be competent to counsel but not every kind of counseling, right? So I'm not a trauma specialist. Uh, I'm not a marriage and families uh, systems therapist. Um, I'm, I'm not a lot of things when it comes to counseling. And so I need to know when to refer you guys and to say, actually, 
this is more than I can do, the, the issues are more complex, and I need to know when to sort of take you to the book. Now, I need to take you to the book all the time. So the primary kind of counseling you should expect from your pastors is counsel from the scripture, is biblical counseling. If you need medication prescribed to you, we can't do that. that that's not our expertise. And and, and we're, not, we're not called to go off and to get uh, MDs and to get basically medical degrees or, or, or psychiatric degrees to, 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 to be able to write that prescription. We've got to be wise enough to involve other folks in the body who may have those resources or may have those expertise and let them play their role in those areas while we specialize on the ministry of the word. And this too, I want to suggest to you, requires humility from leaders, requires humility enough to trust God that he will use his word and that by his word he will grow his church and not to be drawn off in the wisdom of men, right? And, and professing ourselves wise become foolish by abandoning the scripture uh, and sort of giving ourselves to other philosophies or other disciplines and other things that do not give life. And it requires humility to pray. In fact, I think that's what prayer is. Prayer, prayer at its heart is humility. It is bowing before God and saying, I need you. Saying, would you do this? Coming to God like a little child who hasn't learned to tie his shoe and saying, you know, Abba, Father, would you tie my shoe? That's what prayer is, is to humbly know and acknowledge our need and, and to go to the one who supplies it, our Father instead of thinking that the ministry rests on our shoulders or is conducted in our wisdom. So we want leaders here who know how to delegate, and we want leaders who know what their specialization is, the word of God and prayer. And we want to be a congregation then that accepts the delegation and steps up to play the roles and to use the gifts that God gives us. And we want, we want, we want a congregation and a membership who, who supports this division of labor, this specialization, and knows it to be of first importance. Let me come into our last, our last two, our last observation here. Notice now, this is a sermon on multiplication. Notice the two forms of multiplication that happen in this text. Look with me in verses 5 to 7. And what they said pleased the whole gathering, and they chose Stephen, a man full of faith and of the Holy Spirit, and Philip, and Prochorus, and Nicanor, and Timon, and Parmenas, and Nicolaus, a proselyte of Antioch. These they set before the apostles, and they prayed, and laid their hands on them. And the word of God continued to increase, and the number of the disciples multiplied greatly in Jerusalem, and a great many of the priests became obedient to the faith. So the text begins with a growing church in verse 1, and it ends with a growing church in verses 5 to 7. The first form of multiplication we see there in verses 5 and 6. We got seven new leaders there. The multiplication of, of, of diaconal leaders to take care of the practical needs of the church there in Acts chapter 6. And notice what a gift these people are. All of those names except one are Greek names. You say, why is that important? Well, it goes back to verse 1. It goes back to the fact that the Hellenist widows, the Greek-speaking widows, had a complaint that their needs weren't being met. This seems to suggest the fact that all of these six of these seven have Greek-speaking or have Greek names seems to suggest that the church was practicing the kind of cultural competence that we've been talking about. They've appointed some people who would be connected more naturally to that, that community, to that audience, and those persons are not appointed just because they're Greek, or they have Greek names, but they're full of the Holy Spirit and the faith. They're godly, right? And they're going to serve that need. And those kinds of leaders who have contact with cultures, subcultures in the life of the church, who have contact and reach into other categories of people and who are godly and who will care for the needs of the saints, those kinds of people are a great blessing to the church. I mean, how often has, has Precious Rideout and Hannah Baker and Jonah Turner, 
How often in our leadership meetings or in uh, one-on-one conversations have they made us as pastors wiser, for example, about what's happening with women in the congregation? Or, or raise questions and helpful suggestions about uh, some policy or some direction that we're thinking of taking that would make that would make that policy and direction um, more sensitive to the sisters in the church, whether single or married or what have you. And so we we need more and more such leaders who give us more and more access to the different pockets in the life of the church. But notice also. There's multiplication, not just of leaders who are a blessing to the body, but there's the multiplication in verse 7 of the word and of disciples. And the word of God continued to increase, and the number of disciples multiplied greatly in Jerusalem, and a great many of the priests became obedient to the faith. Now, as you observe a connection, if we had kept reading from Acts chapter 1 on into Acts chapter 2, we would have seen it. We see it here again in Acts chapter 6, that very often in the book of Acts, when there is godly leadership appointed, there is God-produced growth that follows. That, That when God supplies gifted and qualified leaders for his church, for the work of the ministry, so that the, the ministry of the word goes forth unimpeded, that very often right behind it, on the tails of it, is a statement like verse 7, where there are thousands added to the church uh, who are being saved, where the number of disciples increase, where the word of God multiplies. Beloved, that's what we want. That's what we want. We want the word of God in our day, in our community, in our city, across the nations. We want the word of God multiplied. We want the disciples to increase greatly. And we want priests of other religions, Hebrew Israelites, uh, Seventh-day Baptists, um, Catholic, whatever, we want them converted to the gospel to come to saving faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. That's why the church is in the earth. That's why we focus on multiplication. That's why, beloved, we plant other churches, like what we're hoping to do this spring with Congress Heights Community Church. We've had the privilege of having our brother Josh Rulak on staff, uh, working, studying with the pastors, preparing uh, to gather a team to go out and evangelize the neighborhood and Uh, to canvas the neighborhood, and to establish a new gospel preaching church just a couple of miles in that direction in Congress Heights. Why? We want to see the word of God multiply. We want to see the number of disciples increase greatly. We, We want to see many people come to faith. And that can happen at our church, yes, but we're selfish if we work in such a way as we think that it should only happen at our church. We want to improve the gospel ecology of our neighborhood. And that means we want to have gospel preaching uh, and teaching congregations all over the neighborhood so that people can get to it and so that the gospel can get to people. We live in a food desert. Part of what that means is uh, over 40% of the households in our neighborhood don't have cars uh, and and grocery stores are are more than like a, a mile away. Well, that means that fresh groceries and things aren't easily accessible to those, to those residents. Well, let me give you another term. It, it might be that we also live in a gospel desert. We also live in a gospel desert where the same folks who don't have cars have the same problem with distance and transportation to get to healthy gospel preaching congregations in our neighborhood. Now, there are other healthy gospel preaching congregations in our neighborhood, but not enough so that the gospel is in walking distance of all of our neighbors. It's within half a mile or a mile of all of our neighbors. We want to improve the gospel ecology by getting more and more churches planted and established so that in these dense communities where sometimes people don't go between neighborhoods, the gospel is there. And that's why we've laid before you the idea of Join the Creek Collective. 
because the, the whole intent of the Creek Collective is to work with other churches and to work with other donors to build a war chest, to build a, a fund that would be used to plant churches like Congress Heights Community Church and others um, to plant churches in these very neighborhoods that we care so much about and that we love, black and brown neighborhoods that have been neglected in so many ways, including neglected with fresh and new and revitalizing gospel work. We want to see multiplication. And by God's grace, we've been seeing it, beloved. Be encouraged. If you're a part of this church family, especially if you've been with us these last five years or six years almost, or even if you've just been with us the last six weeks, be encouraged because we are seeing God answer our prayers in this regard. Two years in as a new church, not quite self-sufficient ourselves, we had the privilege of planting Mercy of Christ up in Northeast. And Pastor Jeremy and the saints who went out and who have since come have been faithful there to evangelize and preach the gospel, to see some conversions and baptisms, pray for that work. And now we're standing on the cusp of seeing, in the other direction, Congress Heights Community Church planted. How many more will the Lord give us if we multiply the leaders in this church and if we have a heart to multiply the gospel um, around our city and around the world? So pray that the Lord raises up leaders and supportive spouses. Pray that the Lord raises up leaders who are committed to the word of God uh, and committed to the ministry of the word in prayer. Pray that the Lord would give us so many leaders that, that we are ahead of the growth curve that he may give us. And pray that he'd give us so many leaders that we would find it easy that when we plant churches, we would be able to send off other leaders with those plants. And pray for conversions. That people would be saved by believing the gospel of Jesus Christ. That he was crucified for them, buried for them, raised from the grave for them and that through repentance and faith in him, they would have eternal life and discover God's love. Pray for that, beloved. Pray for that. And let's watch God work in multiplying this church. Let's pray together. Indeed, Lord, that's what we ask you for, that you would work to multiply your church, multiply the word of God, multiply the leaders in your church, multiply the number of churches, so that this would not be a gospel desert or even a food desert. Because, Lord, through the planting of churches and the preaching of your gospel, we bring it near to every resident. And through the service of mercy and community development, Lord, we would even bring food co-ops and grocery stores into neighborhoods that are food deserts. So feed the people of this neighborhood. Feed them spiritually with your gospel and your word. Feed them physically through the mercy and the ministry. Uh, of your church, Lord, send revival, we pray. So that the strange times that are happening in the world would be overcome by the, the strange and wonderful sign of the outpouring of your spirit in revival. Come, Lord Jesus, we pray. In your great name, amen. Hey, church family. The next song we're about to sing is called God of the City. And we sing it to the Lord, proclaiming that he is the God of this city, the King of this people, the Lord of this nation. May we shine as lights in this world so that he truly is the God of every heart in this city, in this nation, in this world. Love y'all. You're the God of this city. You're the king of this people, you're the Lord of this nation, you are. You're the light in this darkness, you're the hope to the hopeless, you're the peace to the restless, you are. Cause there is no one like God. Greater things have yet to come, and greater things are still to be done in this city. Greater things have yet to come, and greater things are still to be done in this city. 
to be done in this today. You're the Lord of this city. You're the King of this people. You're the Lord of this nation. You are. You're the light in this darkness. You're the hope to the homeless. You're the peace to the restless. You are. Cause there is no one like God. I pray that you were encouraged this morning. I really do. I pray that you were built up in the Lord and that the Lord gave you some vision for how he would use you uh, in service to his people, in service to the community, how he might prepare you to lead in some capacity, uh, to make his name great, to see his gospel go forward, and to see souls saved. I pray that we are filled with faith that the Lord does indeed love us and, and does indeed have plans to use us. With that, let me offer the benediction, the words of blessing. May the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all, both now and forevermore. Amen. Won't you use us, Lord?